Good afternoon, everybody. And welcome to the inaugural Donald L. Sparks Distinguished Lectureship in Soil and Environmental Sciences. I want to thank you all for being here today. My name is Angelia Seifrith. I'm an associate professor in plant and soil sciences and chair of the lectureship committee. And before we get started, I just want to thank the other members of the committee, Rodrigo Vargas, Amy Schober, Yan Jin, and Frank Lynham. And we would also greatly uh, appreciate the outstanding work of Grace Weiser, who's in the back, um, and Dante LaPenta for helping to organize and advertise this event. And thank you all for joining us today. Um, before I introduce our speaker and talk about this lectureship, uh, just a few logistics. After the lectureship, there'll be a question and answer ses session. So there'll be two um, volunteers who will uh, be equipped with microphones, Abby and Gretchen. So if you could raise your hands. They'll, they'll be on either side of the aisle. So if you have a question, please raise your hand. They'll come to you with a microphone so the speaker can hear you. And um, after the lectureship and the Q&A session, there'll be a reception uh, just outside of these double doors. So please stick around um, to interact more with the speaker. So before I introduce our speaker, I just want to say a little bit about this lectureship. The Donald L. Sparks Distinguished Lectureship in Soil and Environmental Sciences was established to advance soil and environmental sciences at the University of Delaware by attracting prominent scholars to interact with students and faculty. The lectureship honors Don's outstanding career in environmental soil chemistry, an impressive record of mentorship in, in this field. He's mentored over 60 graduate students, including today's honoree, Dr. Scott Fendorf. Scott uh, earned his um, undergraduate degree in soil sciences from Cal Poly and his master's in, uh, in soil chemistry from UC Davis before coming to the University of Delaware and earning his PhD in soil chemistry. Um, his dissertation here won the Theodore Wolf Prize for Outstanding Dissertation in the Physical and Life Sciences, and it also won the Emil Truog Award for Outstanding Dissertation by the Soil Science Society of America. Scott started his career at the University of Idaho and later moved to Stanford University where he's been for most of his career. He was the founding chair of the Department of Earth System Science and he's currently the Terry Huffington Professor of Environmental, uh, I'm sorry, of Earth Science and Senior Associate Dean of Academic Affairs. He is a fellow of the Geochemical Society, the Soil Science Society of America and the European Association of Geochemistry and he's won several teaching and mentoring awards. Um, much of his work examines soil chemical processes that affect mobility of contaminants in the environment and um, also the large scale implications for human health. So please, let's welcome Dr. Scott Fendorf. All right, thanks everybody. Um, it's a great crowd, thanks for everybody coming. Before I get started, a um, couple of things. First of all, it's a rather formal uh, atmosphere here and I'm dressed pretty formally, but I'm actually a very casual speaker. So you're gonna have to deal with that dichotomy and I'll, I'll try to do my best to, to keep it going that way. Um, also beside that, I wanna uh, first acknowledge Don and make sure that I thank him for um, starting this prof um, endowed lectureship and uh, I'm really uh, super excited to be the, the inaugural speaker and so thanks to the committee and particularly Angie for organizing all of this and then um, everybody else that's helped uh, make this possible. So that's, that's my quick introduction. So what I wanna do next is switch over and talk about my, my actual um, topic here and that's about water and health and food. And I'm gonna actually leave most of the food side out and talk mostly about water instead. So bear with me on that. So it's not surprising that uh, we look in the newspaper all the time, we're seeing events around climate change, we're seeing things around um, scarcity of food, but we also see it a lot for water. And so I wanna get into that just a little bit further. And this is really gonna be germane, whether we're talking about uh, areas of the developing world. So you could be thinking up here, like on the bottom right. So this is areas of, of India that are really um, stressed for, for water delivery, um, or it could be at, in the Western US where we have really big problems with water scarcity as well. And I really wanna give both the global US and then a kind of Western um, centric view of this. And so just to start to give everybody a perception of, of the problem that we face, and, so conservatively, there's about 1.2 billion people right now that lack access to safe water. That's not counting water scarcity in terms of things for delivery for agriculture and so on, but this is just um, decent access to safe water. So 1.2 billion people 
What's really amazing about this number is that if you actually got into the water quality parameters and we started thinking about what we would consider safe, that number would easily jump over $2 billion, or $2 billion, $2 billion, it's probably $2 billion, um, bigger than that, 2 billion people. Um, so it's a really large fraction of the earth that is lacking access to water. So um, that's where I wanna go with this. And so when we think about this, then it really is a global water issue and we wanna think around that perspective of what that ends up meaning. So what I wanna go into is thinking about water resources broadly and, and talk about both the quantity, but particularly the quality of the water. And that's something that I, I focus on and I'll explain what I mean by quality. Cause a lot of times we're gonna maybe think quality means um, how good is the taste or how clear is it? But really what we're gonna talk about is how healthy is it? And that's what I'm gonna mean by, by water quality. So first keeping um, going along here with um, thinking about global water scarcity. So just the lack of water access is that you can look across the map here and see that there is a really a large population of the globe that lacks access um, to safe drinking water or to just an amount of water that they need. And so this can move into irrigated agriculture as well. Some of this is actually physical scarcity where we just don't have enough water. And other times it can be a problem with water quality and other times it can be a problem with water delivery or water access. And so if we, switch this and also just continue along the vein of quantity of water, you can look and see how much of the, the globe is really having problems with um, access to, to water. So where we're seeing groundwater depletion. Um, what's hidden in this because of the scale of what we're seeing here is that if you look up at, at the map here and we're focused, see if I can do it here, yeah, I did it. So it's a little broad, but if you go here in Western US, you look at where California is, it's bright red, right? So the Central Valley of California is bright red in terms of water scarcity. So you can look around this and I guess what I'm really trying to get at is that the problem is massive. And so what I wanna do is continue along that just for one more moment and say that it's gonna get worse too. So the, all the projections are based on uh, climatic factors of changing rainfall patterns along with increased global temperatures is that our, our water scarcity along with population growth is gonna make that a, a much bigger issue. Okay, so that's my kind of broad scale introduction. Where I wanna go from, from there is getting into specific examples. And so not surprising, I'm from the West Coast and uh, Western US being drier, so west of the 100th meridian basically in the US, you start getting into really problems with water scarcity because of lack of rainfall. So being in the Eastern seaboard here, it's a little different issue. Um, get into quality aspects really specifically rather than just thinking about scarcity. But I'm gonna use California then as an example and um, try to, um, get you excited to understand the problem and then come at the very end, I'm gonna mostly be a doomsday person and talk a lot about the problems, about 85% is gonna be the problems and then I'm gonna spend 15% of the talk giving you some hope at the very end, okay? So just so you know where I'm going with that, okay? All right, so there we go. So let's just start with California because it, it, um, it really epitomizes some of the problems. I wanna give you just a, a quick background. So I spent about 20 years of my career working on problems in South and Southeast Asia of, of groundwater problems. And so they have about a fifth of Asia's groundwater is contaminated with arsenic. And I'll show you a, a little bit of this later on. And when I was working there, I really thought that I would never come back and work in the developed world on water issues. And mainly because we have solutions to them all the time. You have a water problem in a community, you pipe water in and you bring bottled water. It just didn't seem like a big issue. And about six years ago, California had the beginning of this long-standing drought that came in. And I realized at that point that there was two things that I had wrong. The first one was that the Western, or not the Western world or the developed world in general is gonna have really huge problems that are easily as problematic as what we're seeing in a lot of the develop, developing economies. And then I should really think about those a little bit more carefully. And the second one was that when I started digging in and looking a little closer, um, on that, especially in California where I was starting to work on this, I realized that there was actually a lot of disadvantaged communities that looked very similar to what I was seeing in places like Vietnam or Cambodia or Bangladesh that equally didn't have access to, to drinking water resources. It was really surprised me. So those are two things that really motivated me, but mostly I wanna talk about um, the aspects of what's happening with um, our future uh, climate and what that's gonna mean for water. Okay, so I'm gonna give you a, a, a little tutorial on how uh, California deals with its water issues. So right now, what California does is it has a long-term um, storage from snowpack. So what happens is that, you probably know this if you've, if you've been to California, is that we have the Sierras there, the Sierra mountain range picks up a lot of snow, about 40% of um, California's water is actually stored as the snowpack there. And so every winter we get snow. Um, I just flew over them coming here, right? So I was looking at the snow, need a little more, but, um, but still quite a bit of snow right now. And so that then is a storage from December 
about December through March. So that's our, our, our snowpack. Stores the water there, keeps it from running off. So then what happens starting in about late March or, or April, we take that water as it comes out and we bring it into our surface reservoirs. So California has a whole series of, of reservoirs, oh, there we go, right, that are built around the state. They, they then store the water. We fill them back up from April through June. Some of that water that's, that's also coming out of the snowpack is running off and being used for irrigation. And so then we have a series of canals that runs that all across the state. If you know anything about California, I'm from Northern California, that's where I grew up, and uh, we get the water, and we always think of Southern California as using all the water, and it sets up a little tension there. Northern Californians think they have all the water rights and that the Southerners are using all the water, which is kind of true, but um, anyways, <laughs> so the, the other part though is that, so these canals come down, and there's a mountain range, the Tehachapi's that separates, and the San Gabriel's that separates Northern California anomaly from Southern California, so we pipe the water over that, so it uses a, a, a tremendous amount of energy to do that. That's how we do a water distribution system. Okay, and so that gets us then until through the summer, and then we have our kind of late fall to, to get through, meek through with whatever we have left, and we supplement that with a little bit of groundwater. But here's a big problem that we're gonna have. So as we look to the future, one thing that's absolute for California is that it's gonna get warmer. And we're already seeing this, that the snowpack every year, the elevation, average elevation of snowfall creeps up a little bit. And so what that ends up doing is that even if we get exactly the same amount of precipitation, instead of coming down as snow and storing and being stored in the mountains between December and March, it comes down as rainfall and it runs back off. So it runs off immediately. And what that does is it's great for the fisheries and the local ecosystems aquatic ecosystems, but it's not good for California's water system, right? It derails the entire system. And so what that ends up meaning then is that if it's coming off, instead of getting Sierra snowfall, you're getting Sierra rainfall, it means that you have to figure out how you're gonna deal with that four months of storage and where that water is gonna go, okay? So let's think about that for just a moment. So I spell it out here. So it means that if, if we have, um, Warming means that we have less snow. And so if we have less snow, we get more rain. If we get more rain, it means that we need to increase the storage. So let's think about that. So I wanna do one quick exercise. I wanna belabor this point, but if, if you were challenged, Gavin Newsom is the governor of California right now. So if he came into this room and said, I want you to break off into twos and threes, I'm not gonna have you do that. But if he did that and think up what, the, what an easy solution would be, what would you all come up with? Where, how would you increase California's water storage? What would be the simple thing? And I'm trying to bait you by having a, a picture up here, <laughs> right? What would you want to do? Yeah, you want to build more dams, right? Store more water. Okay, so there, there's problems on the ecosystem side we could talk about, but let's, let's just get rid of that for the moment because we don't need to go there. And let's just say, okay, let's build more dams. So <clears throat> we're going to get hire two people. We're going to get a geologist to be able to look at rock structures and geologic formations. And we're going to get a civil engineer and we're gonna team them up and figure out all the areas we can build dams, right? And so that team comes back and gives the report to Gavin Newsom, how much do you think you can increase the storage of water in California with that, see? Okay, so let's get some guesses in, in there. 5%, 10%, 20%, 50%. Anybody wanna be bold and give me a number? All right, it's 10%. That's actually not too far off. Probably between right now, the estimates are about 5%. Maybe, maybe, maybe liberally 10%, but 5% is a pretty, pretty good number to go with. Okay, so if 40% of the water is stored in the Sierras and now gonna come out as rainfall and we can increase storage by 5%, those new two numbers don't work so well, yeah? Right, okay, so can't build enough dams to store the water. What's our other option? There's only one. Thank you. So below ground storage, right? So we try to put it in underground and store basically stored as an aquifer. Before I do that, let me just show you one other kind of interesting map. So this is the number of dams that have been built essentially over time. And what you can see is that not even just in California, but globally, that number is maxed out. And it's largely because we've cherry picked all the easy places to put dams and there's just not a lot of geologic formation where we can go back and put in dams. So we've kind of arrested that and there's still a little bit of capacity, but it's not huge anymore. All right, so let's go with the other option. So we wanna put water below ground. And so there's different ways we could do that. We could have passive infiltration, right? So we could just have a pond that has a percol percolation in the bottom of it, water fil infiltrates through that, or we could pump it in, right? So we could actually have pumps that move it down, take some energy, but we could do that. 
Okay? So those are, those are different options, and this is what it looks like actually um, being applied. So this is on the left-hand side, a classic infiltration basin. I'll explain later where this is. But classic infiltration basin, those ponds percolate in um, millions of gallons of water into the subsurface where you can then store it in um, sands and gravels that are presently not having water in there. So it's basically you're creating an aquifer. Um, you can do it with pumps as well. So we often think of those kind of big bore pumps as pulling water out, but you can push it back in as well. Okay, and so um, if you look at, at the um, chart for what's happened in terms of storing water underground, it's on the far right up here, you can see that that has also increased um, exponentially over the, the last couple decades. All right, and there's a reason. So what we're basically seeing is that across the globe, there's an increased reliance on groundwater because we just don't meet the needs with the surface water. We also have problems with pathogens in a lot of surface water. I won't get into that too much, but um, we're gonna be reliant, we're gonna be more reliant on groundwater. So that's, that's really great. But there's a couple challenges, and it's the whole reason that um, I'm up here talking to you is because what I've said up to this point, all is feasible, it's really great. And then there's something that people are only now starting to recognize, and it's what I really want to get across to you, is that when we think about surface water bodies, you could have a surface water body where you literally line the, the, um, the pond or the lake with lead, and you filled it up, and you wouldn't have a problem really with water quality. You'd say like, oh my God, don't drink it, it's lead lined. But the lead would end up being so dilute that you wouldn't ever really have much of a problem. Now, I still wouldn't advocate that, but by and large, we can make the measurements and, and say like, okay, yeah, the lead's really below drinking water standards. Okay, and the reason is in mostly because of that volume to surface area ratio. There's a lot of water and just a little contact. But let's change that. So when you go below ground, I used to have this fantasy before I got, got into this that so when I was a kid that an underground aquifer was like a big swimming pool underwater, right? This big cavernous reservoir. And that's, there's a couple of places in Missouri where that's true now, where we've, aligned, where we've mined out all these big, uh, mostly lead, deposit, lead ore deposits and taken them out. And you can look under there with big limestone areas that they've um, excavated and they fill back up with water. And so it kind of fits that model. But by and large, that's not the case. What it really is are sands and gravels. And in those sands and gravels are water that then can percolate through. And we can put a pump down and get the water to move to that, to, sorry, a pump, um, a pipe. And we can get the water to move to that pipe pretty readily. But what it ends up meaning is that we have actually a lot of solids and a little bit of water. So the ratio, the surface area to ratio, volume ratio flips. So it might be a thousand to one volume of water in a lake to the surface area contact. And then when we go underground, it flips. It's now like a thousand um, to one surface area now to volume of water. So what it means is that we have a little speck of a contaminant underground and it could contaminate all of our water. And that becomes a big issue. Okay, so what I want to go from there is then talk about what are really the major threats to groundwater. So we often think about, if I talk about water quality, you might think again about these things of taste and so on. We could put those up there, but let's take those off for the moment. They're important sometimes, but for now, let's take them off. So let's think about other aspects that degrade water quality. Well, pathogens would be a big one. And it turns out groundwater is generally pathogen free, so that's a really good thing. But what are other things that degrade water quality? I just used one in the case of the lakes. What was one that I was using? Yeah, I was using lead, right? So something that's like a metal toxin. And so let's think about those for a moment. So when we, before I go on the next slide, I'll bait you just a little bit more. So we're just below New Jersey here. If we go up to Northern New Jersey, New Jersey there's these famous ponds that are orange from picking up chromium from chromate that percolates down in, contaminates groundwater. And so those are kind of classic ways we can contaminate groundwater is some type of anthropogenic industrial effect that contaminates the groundwater. And that usually um, is really an acute problem for a really, really, really tiny area, right? So I don't want to dismiss it, but it's a really small area that we're talking about. So where, what are really widespread things? naturally occurring elements. And so what we call those are geogenic threats, things that are actually of geologic origin. And so this is something we don't think about commonly in the public, but it turns out that every aquifer, every aquifer, no matter where it is, has a contaminant in it, probably multiple contaminants. And that becomes a big problem because if those contaminants transfer from being in the sediments to being in the water, then our water quality over vast areas gets jeopardized. Not just a local, you know, one acre area where you might not be able to drill, put wells in anymore, but now you might be talking about the entire state of California, right? Or a whole country. And so the classic ones that really I would wanna harp on here are things like chromium, arsenic, 
uranium and manganese. Those are just four. There's plenty of others that we could put in here, but those are four that are pretty universal. And in California, in fact, all four of those are a threat, at least individually, if not in combination. And so when we look at groundwater throughout, and I'll show some of these in a little bit, they actually become really problematic. And so this is something that I really want to kind of hammer home this night. If you, if you walk out of here and not remember anything else, this is the one thing I want you to remember, is that there are these naturally occurring elements that are problematic to human health and that they occur globally. So let me give you just a few examples of those and then um, I'll, I'll progress on and, and talk a little bit more about sp specific ways that they get triggered. So this is the um, Indo-Gangetic Plain um, across basically the northern part of India that goes into Pakistan, borders Nepal, comes down into Bangladesh. It serves about one billion people. So it's a huge swath of land in terms of uh, thinking about it for groundwater. And the groundwater is used pervasively um, for both irrigation but also for um, domestic uses. So big water body, it turns out that the water, this is really kind of an interesting factoid, it turns out the water quantity is actually stabilized here. You would think that so many people tapping into it and in arid environments around it, that it would be depleting. But it turns out when the British colonized this area, one of the things they did is they redistributed the surface water in canals to supply water mostly for agriculture. But the canals were unlined, which turned out to be really inefficient because guess what? The, unlined canals were doing? What was the water doing? It's percolating down. But, so then if you start thinking about groundwater, what was it doing from a groundwater perspective? It's replenishing it, right? So it turns out the water was being replenished and it still holds today. So it's this really marvelous way of replenishing groundwater, but it has a big problem. And the big problem is that 55% of that water is contaminated either with high salts or even worse with arsenic, right? So about 28% of the water is contaminated with arsenic. It's all naturally occurring. It comes in the Himalayas. It's not anything anybody did. It turned out it was just laying there in the weight. When people started using the groundwater, it became problematic because you were using groundwater. Right? Now, there are things that you can do to make it worse. There's things you can do to make it better, but it was there all along. Okay? And that's what we have to really be cognizant of. Okay, so let's, it's not just in Asia that we have to think about that. So if you look at uranium, switch to a different element, and you look in the US, big threats from uranium. It turns out nitrate's another one. So you can see the big um, groundwater aquifers here in the central Midwest and then in California that are used for agricultural purposes. Those have big threats from things like nitrate and uranium. Right? So it isn't just um, a problem uh, in other continents. Right? So if I switch over and just use California again as an example, it turns out that 98 water supply systems are contaminated with, with arsenic. So this isn't like a well, this is a whole water district that we're talking about. So this is a really, really big area that we're talking about, a big problem. So let me just give you a little bit more on this in terms of trying to scale the problem. So this is what it looks like if you're looking at these different contaminants that I'm talk talking about here. And so I was just mentioning arsenic. So this is arsenic right up there, right? And so just look at the number of kind of red and orange. Those are all the wells or the well fields that are out of compliance with arsenic, with relation to arsenic, okay? So you can look across this and you can see just from the number of red, except for um, basically selenium, there's a lot of problem in groundwater, or with groundwater quality in California. All right, so let me switch then and I'm gonna spend just a, a little time now going into how we actually see that the contaminants go from being in the sediments or in the, the minerals and rocks to getting into the water themselves. And so this is really what we think of as like the, the causes of, of the contamination. As I do that, I'm going, to, I'm going to get into some chemistry and I'm going to get into some biology coupled with chemistry and put some, some physical transport in there as well. So if that's not your thing, just hang on. I'll get back to the practical. But if it is your thing, then great. Um, and part of this, I also want to spend a little time um, talking about Don's work and, and how much he's influenced me and, and, and the globe. So I'll, I'll, I'll put that in there. So he's, he's really been one of the fathers of thinking about the molecular chemistry that happens within these natural environments. And so there are really three big triggers that cause arsenic or uranium or chromium or any of these other elements to go from being in the sediments to being in the water. And so we break those down into the top two are really the transfer of electrons between elements and we call that oxidation or reduction, right? So we can have um, things like uranium that sit in ore deposits and when they get transferred through oxidation from uranium four plus to uranium six plus, it becomes a big problem. There are other things like arsenic where you run out of oxygen and you go into what are anaerobic environments. So, so now it's a reduction reaction and arsenic has a, uh, moves from say plus five to plus three and now it becomes a big problem. 
Right? So those are redox reactions that we call them, and it's a transfer of electrons, and it's usually around whether we have oxygen getting into the aquifer or we, we don't. Okay, and then the last one here is what we call um, dissolution or desorption. So we have all these minerals down there. The minerals can dissolve or reprecipitate, or things that are stuck on them come on or off, right? So that's adsorption, desorption. So those are the main processes. So if we have things that are sticking onto all the minerals, that's good, right? That's what we want, because it's not in the water. If things are coming off all the solids and getting in the water, that's bad. That's basically how it breaks down, okay? All right, so let me give you a, some quick examples of that and how it works. So one is the problem that we're seeing in South and Southeast Asia where we have this massive contamination of the aquifers. And so what it turns out is that you had the Himalayan sediments that's bearing arsenic in it coming down the big river systems, comes down out of the Himalayas, deposits out in all the lowlands. So Bangladesh is an example. About two thirds of it are just deposits from the Himalayan sediments, all bearing arsenic. Not a problem at first though, because the, the arsenic is in the sediments, not in the water. But as those sediments gradually get buried by more sediments coming on top, things change. And the big thing that changes is that there is now a lack of oxygen. And when you have food for the microbes that are there, this is what happens is that if you give them something like glucose or, or just give them decomposed plant material, so give them the cellulosic material, they, the bacteria react to change the chemistry and cause the arsenic from being on the sediments to being in the water. And so you can see this in the bottom curve here where you have a control where there's no microbial activity and the arsenic just stays nice and happily on the, or we think of it as happily, on the sediments and no problem. So it's really this combination of food for the bacteria and a lack of oxygen that causes arsenic to come off. And this is the cartoon version of it. So this is just uh, a version of glucose on the left-hand side going to CO2 by using the bacterial metabolism. And they're, instead of using oxygen to breathe, they're using iron minerals and arsenic. And what that ends up doing is it creates then this is a product, which is arsenic and iron going into the water phase. That's bad, right? And so that's in, in a nutshell what's happening. Here's the scale of the problem. If you look at, at Bangladesh, um, and I saw Holly out here earlier. So Holly and Michael did a bunch of, of work on this as well, um, looking at the flow patterns and the distribution. So what you end up seeing though, if you're looking at the health data is that uh, roughly a little more than a third of the country is drinking water with very hazardous levels of arsenic. And the health consequence, consequences are really um, quite pronounced and I, I'll just leave it at that rather than going into it if anybody wants to talk about the gruesomeness of what happens afterwards, uh, we can get into that. But I'll just leave it, it's really bad, okay? Um, and so here's the scale of the problem. I told you I'd, I'd mention this. So these are all the different aquifers that are contaminated with the number of people that are living on the lands there. So you can look across this and see 12 million in the Indus River, 150-ish in the Ganges Delta, and you can go on around and see it. These are huge numbers of people that are being impacted by contaminated groundwater, all naturally occurring, again, not recognizing that it was there ends up being a problem. All right, so let, let me switch and talk about another active one. And so uranium turns out to be a big problem that's showing up in a lot of areas, California being one of them. And so what ends up happening with, with uranium is it's the reverse of arsenic where a lack of oxygen becomes a problem. With uranium, it's actually oxygen and nitrate that become the problem. So uranium is often an in the sediments that are coming out of the Sierras and depositing in the Central Valley, it's actually in this mineral UO2, largely. Um, and that mineral regulates the dissolved concentration of uranium quite low, so it's not a problem. But if it reacts with oxygen, in this case, it can end up forming um, a different product that's over here on, oops, get the right, that right there. So that's another molecule of uranium. It's an oxidized version of it. And it turns out not to partition very well onto the solids, and so it becomes a big problem. Turns out there's another aggravator of this, and that's nitrate. So nitrate can also get in and cause uranium to be oxidized. And so there's a lot of people here that I know, um, if I say the background, I'm gonna uh, answer my own question. Where does nitrate really come from? Like what's a, where is nitrate, like where are the areas that you really have pronounced nitrate problems? So Delaware has it. <laughs> Yeah, so it's usually associated with agriculture, so it can anywhere be from fertilizers to um, animal, animal yards, right? So nitrate is a contaminant by itself, but it also is a big aggravator for uranium because it causes it to be oxidized. And in fact, I showed you this, this map earlier. 
Nitrate and uranium correlate with each other quite significantly in the aquifers across the US, and that's because nitrate aggravates the problem of uranium. So it's a contaminant by itself, but it also causes uranium to be problematic. Okay, it, but it's not actually that simple, and I wanna dig into this just a little bit more, and I always laugh at myself because um, it's always good to kind of branch off on this. So I'm talking about groundwater, and then I use metaphors like, let's dig into it. So. Um, <laughs> I don't actually do that in purpose, but it may be subliminally I'm trying to do that. Oh. So anyways, but we're really gonna go down underground and, and talk a little bit more about this. And then I promise you, I'm gonna bring you back up to, to um, management and, and thinking a little bit more about um, the broad scale perspective of this. So again, if this is like, oh, I'm not really into the chemistry, we'll, we'll get there. But I think this one's super interesting and super important. So it turns out, that, so bear with me for a moment because I'm gonna get into a little bit of chemical detail. And I want, want to again emphasize that this is something that Don's group is really, really pushed and it becomes super important. I wanna show you why it's so important to understand the molecular chemistry of these contaminants. So this um, next one is gonna be a picture here. So this is kind of a abstract. This is bicarbonate. So this is just think of it as um, CO2 that's been dissolved, dissolved in the water or um, other aspects of your no nuances of carbonate chemistry. Um, we can get into that more. So microbial respiration and so on, creating bicarbonate. Okay, and then that's against the uranium concentration in wells throughout the Central Valley of California. And what you end up seeing there, I think you can see this, a lot of data, but, but it's a pretty strong correlation, right? So when you look at groundwater, we saw a correlation to nitrate, but we actually see a much stronger correlation to bicarbonate. And so the reason behind that was really unknown for, for quite a while, but it turns out that if you start looking at these different species, this one on the top here is that is one of the molecules of, of uranium-6 that I mentioned, the UO2-2+. So this is the solid uranium that I was talking about earlier. That would be in the sediments. It ends up getting oxidized and forms that. And then it, what it does is it goes over here. Let's see if I can get it right. There we go. All right. It reabsorbs onto minerals that are sitting in the sediments. No problem, right? It goes from being in one mineral to going into the water and then reabsorbing and sticking on the top of other minerals or on the surface of other minerals. Good enough. For me, that's totally fine. I'm, I'm cool with that. All right? Okay. So this is basically what's regulating the uranium until we get something that happens secondarily. And that turns out is that when you add in calcium and carbonate, you form minerals like calcium carbonate, but you do something else with uranium. It turns out the carbonate reacts with the uranium to form a new molecule, and the calcium reacts with that molecule to form yet another molecule, and it's really a calcium uranyl carbonate is what we call this, and that molecule does not like to stick to anything. So instead of absorbing back onto the other minerals, this one over here likes to stay by itself in the water. That's bad, right? So what ends up happening then is that when we end up getting the formation of this form of uranium, we see it going into the water. At least that's our presumption. That's what would happen. So let me show you something that's really I think super impressive. So this last year, we took the public data sets for the Central Valley of California, and we plotted all of the, the wells that were out of compliance. Well, we plotted all the groundwater data that we had for uranium, and we plotted that against what we could calculate would be the, the species of uranium. So how much of the, of the uranium was in that form that I said shouldn't stick? And it turns out, so that's, this is the percent of that molecule that we'd think shouldn't stick. And it turns out that only one well was out of compliance with uranium that didn't have that complex. All the other wells, 95% of those wells have uranium. Sorry, let me rephrase that. All but one well have 95% of the uranium in that molecular form. So if you didn't have calcium and carbonate in the water reacting with the uranium, there wasn't a problem with uranium in the groundwater. That's why we care about these molecular mechanisms so much, is all of a sudden we understand, oh man, we have to really be cognizant of how calcium building up in an aquifer or carbonate, bicarbonate in particular, is gonna be problematic. So let me show you one more graph that illustrates this. So this complicated set of curves here shows the uranium concentrations on the left with the groundwater um, standard there. And what's on the, the bottom axis there is the bicarbonate. And those curves then show different calcium concentrations. And so what you can see is that as you increase the, 
bicarbonate concentration and you increase the calcium concentration, the amount of uranium that goes into the water phase increases and it increases massively. That becomes super important because when you're managing, and California is now starting to think about massive implementation of groundwater recharge, and all that recharge that they're thinking about right now is to percolate through the soils in the Central Valley, which is um, a, normally a desert. What do deserts have at their surface? Like if you're, I flew over Utah. What was I looking out at when I was going across the Great Salt Lake? What did it look like? Yeah, it was all white. And then a lot of that sodium chloride. But what else is in there? What, what's building up? They're all salts. But the salts include what? Calcium and carbonates. And so now we let that water percolate nice and slowly through those, those layers. Guess what they pick up? Calcium and carbonate, right? And then they percolate down and they meet the uranium down 30 or 40 feet. And guess what they do to the uranium? They make it go into the water phase, right? And we can start to see this already happening. So it becomes a really critical factor when you're thinking about managing the aquifers that you understand that chemistry. So let me show you one, one last um, part on this that I think is really fascinating. And that is something that's actually a really kind of interesting physical effect. It's not a good one, but it's an interesting one. It's really important also for areas that are they're using groundwater. And that's what happens as we extract the groundwater. Oh, I'm in bad habit. I, I always, I don't usually have one of these, so I like to go over to my computer and push the buttons. That's what. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna switch and I'm gonna go to Vietnam for a moment just to keep us global. We have the same data set, data set for California. What I'm gonna show you from Vietnam is exactly the same thing that's been happening in California. Okay, so it turns out in the lower part of Vietnam, groundwater is being used a lot but for municipal purposes, it turns out in this case, and they're drawing the water from fairly deep down in the aquifer. So there's a lot of shallow groundwater that's being used throughout South and Southeast Asia. It's problematic with arsenic. The deep groundwater is supposed to be safe though. It's supposed to not have arsenic in it. But when we start looking at the groundwater, it turns out that after it's been pumped for quite, a, quite some time, that you have high arsenic at the surface, then it goes down quite a bit, you know, see if you look over there, it's about 100 meters, it's hitting a minimum, and then it comes back up deeper in the, in the um, subsurface. And so the question is, is why is that? And so I wanna get into this, that we start looking at these cross sections and realize that these aquifers are actually over here are really complex. So the blue is actually the sands and gravels, and then the gray are, this, are this, the clay layers that have been put in there. So we have these aquifers that are kind of um, staggered in there. So it's a multiple aquifer system. And what we found is that it, as this groundwater is being pumped, the arsenic concentrations from deep start increasing. At first they're really low, and then over time they're increasing. And when you start looking at the surface, there's something else that's happening, and that is the ground surface is going down. So you're getting subsidence at the same time the arsenic concentrations are going up. And that's really perplexing. Like, well, they're both bad, but why are they linked? And it turns out the answer to that is that when you look below ground, it's the clay layers that are actually doing the shrinking. So all those clay layers in the, that I showed in there, and it turns out that in the clay layers, they have arsenic in the water. But that water normally wasn't being extracted until we over pumped. And then the clays are like dirty sponges and they're getting squeezed down. And as, they get, as we squeeze them, the water in those, in those clays or in that sponge comes out and starts going into the groundwater. And now we start picking that up, okay? And so how we manage, aquifers turns out to be really important, both in terms of, I said earlier, what we're putting in, that was my example for, for uranium, but also how we take the water out and how we balance that water. Okay, so that was 85% of my doom and gloom. Okay, now I'm gonna switch and give you, I'm gonna wrap it up with the last few slides on uh, a really good example, and one that I picked on earlier. So that's why uh, I'm doing it again, so I'm gonna, okay. All right, so it turns out, I mentioned earlier, if you didn't catch this, I think everybody did, I'm from Northern California. Um, spent two years in Delaware though. Then went back to the well, Pacific Northwest, then to back to California. So Southern California uses all the water. And so I always think of them as uh, Southern California, bad with water. But it turns out that during the drought, I started to recognize that Orange County Water District didn't have a problem at all during the drought. And in fact, if we look at Orange County Water District, which is basically the southern half of the LA basin, so half of LA, if you wanna think of it this way, it's their water supply system, has this really diversified portfolio of how they manage water 
and it turns out all of it was with groundwater management. All their water, all the water that they use is stored underground. So they take water, so where, if any of you, we're on the East Coast, but if you think about historic times, does anybody know what's famous for Southern California using water and battling water rights? Like where did most of Southern California's water thought to come from? Not Northern California, but where else? Colorado River, that's right. And so back in the 1950s and 60s, about half of Orange County's water came from the Colorado River. Now it's less than 15%, right? So it's really switched to diversified, okay? And it's switched over to all of the water, even the 15% that they get from the Colorado River goes back underground. Their largest supply of water is actually from recycled water. So they take municipal water, my wife still is like, oh, but it's like, it's totally fine. <laughs> you take, take sewage water, run it through really advanced treatments, so it's basically just like deionized water. Then you actually, it's so clean, you have to put a little bit of salt back into it. They do it as actually as calcium carbonate, and then they let it go back underground. And they do that in different ways. They do some of it as percolation ponds that I showed earlier. They do some of it as injection, but they put all that water back underground, and they manage it really, really carefully. So they keep their water levels within about 10% of a constant value. They record exactly what all the municipalities are pumping back out because that's how they distribute the water. So they don't pipe it around the surface. You actually have the different municipalities across the southern basin of the LA pumping the water out, but they monitor how much is coming out and Orange County Water District makes sure that much is going back in. So they maintain the water quantity. But the other thing that they do is they watch the quality really carefully. And it turns out that they have a problem. And one of their big problems is they have arsenic in their, in their sediments. And it could, it could basically um, make water for about five to 10 million people non-portable. Now they would then go to advanced treatment to probably get the arsenic back out, but it would be a huge problem for them because they're not networked to do that right now. Right, the water's supposed to distribute out. So it turns out through management and understanding of this, they can inject water across a really complicated set of stratigraphy all at the same time, so they pump in water over here into a well, and these, those cross hatch lines are what are called screens, and that's where the water flows back out into the sediments. They can then adjust the chemistry of the water coming in so that they can always control, just like we would do in the laboratory, the chemistry around that part of the aquifer, and they can make it so that if you look at what's happening with arsenic over here, their water comes in here causes the arsenic to go up, but what they can eventually do is they figure out how to adjust the chemistry. So as their water hits the aquifer, if it's causing a trigger to cause arsenic to come out, they know enough of the chemistry and they work with people, which is how I know about this because I ended up doing a bunch of work with them. They know how to go back and re-engineer the chemistry of the aquifer so the arsenic goes back on the sediments and stays there. And it's a really, really cool, successful project. Now, they have a lot of money to do this. Their economics are in their favor. So the big challenge is that when you move to poor water districts that maybe are supplying it for agricultural purposes or for communities that just don't have that kind of money, can you do that re-engineering? And by and large, right now, a lot of the tricks that we're figuring out are yes, but it's big paying attention to these molecular processes, putting those in the construct of how you can engineer the system and then making sure that you're cognizant of it so that you, when you go in and deal with these complicated aquifer systems, you can actually pull water back out safely. And so that's my, my ending message, is that really when we think about these threats to groundwater quality, there are really solutions for both maintaining the quantity so that we don't see a diminished quantity of water, but also making sure that we're really preserving the quality. But it's by understanding that there are these natural contaminants in every aquifer everywhere across the world, and that if we're not careful of that, we can have really jeopardized um, water quality that's becomes very difficult and very expensive to deal with. But if we get ahead of the game and deal with it while it's underground, before it becomes problematic, it's really something that we can resolve. So one last thing, I just wanna give one more shout out to Don and, and his career. So to go back in time, this is, I had one from 1990, when I, I started here in 1990. I, it wasn't as good, so I took the one from 91. So that's us in, in the lab in 1991 in, in Warlow Hall, which is now going through renovation. And then this was um, in 2015 when one of um, Don's postdocs organized a, um, kind of a really cool trip. Um, 
I don't always like to, to travel, but this one was way too good to, to pass up. So um, he organized it so that we would be on a speaking tour together. And so we got to go through China, and, and it was just this really super fun event where we traveled through China and talked together. And so this was the Three Gorges Dam um, in 2015. And you can see a difference between um, the two of us, between them. But what's, what's interesting about Don is that, you know, he, um, I won't say how old he is, but he, he still, like, you know, he's got a little more gray hair, but other than that, he looks the same, right? So, okay, all right, so I'll, I'll stop there. There's a lot of people that did all the work that I, I presented, and so I want to make sure that I acknowledge them as well. And I'll say one last thing is I just really, again, thank you all for coming and, and taking your time out of the afternoon to, to stay here and listen to, to me gab on this stuff. Um, if there's time, I don't know, actually, if there's time for questions, and that's cool, I'm happy to take them. Um, and I know there's a reception afterwards, and I'm happy to talk more then. So thanks. Yeah, we have plenty of time for questions, so just raise your hand, and um, Gretchen or Abby will come around. Uh, professor, would it make sense economically or, or, or any other reason to Hold blind? on one second. I'm, I'm, sorry. Blind. We're, I'm blind. Where? Oh, oh sorry, there we go. Right here. Oh, okay. <laughs> so the, yeah, I've seen people do this before. Like, you can't find the first audience. Thank you. Oh, okay. uh, would it make sense to actually harvest the arsenic and, and uranium and other things for use? Yeah, okay. That's a great question, and I wish the answer was yes. Um, but you can tell already the answer is no. And here's why is that. It takes um, actually very little to contaminate an, uh, a water system. So when you quantitatively extract it back out, which turns out to be fairly expensive um, to concentrate it down, you just cannot get there economically. So it would be really, really great because it would be a wonderful economic incentive for filtering it back out, but it turns out it's, it's really not viable. So if we had something that was like iridium or a really, 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 really valuable element that would be maybe possible, but not with something like arsenic and Probably not even with uranium, well, definitely not with uranium, too. Yeah. Hi, uh, good talk, thank you. Uh, and Kate like, oh, I'm wondering, uh, do you expect uh, the absorption capacity of the soil to uh, fill up of arsenic um, over time, and will you have to change the location of the aquifer? Hmm. Yeah, great question. So if you, th th um, I have to, I'm going to add extra to that question so that I can answer it accurately. If you have a constant supply of arsenic that's coming in to the system, then you could hit a maximum capacity where, in fact, you, you are um, exceeding the mineral's ability to really absorb that fraction. You would see then arsenic or uranium, whatever it is, going up. Um, and a lot of these cases, though, where we see, um, say, arsenic is also has iron in the water as well. And so as um, the arsenic uh, wa contaminated water comes into a system, the iron also is coming in, and it gets oxidized. And when that happens, it recreates new minerals. And so it's a self-generating, uh, a self-regenerating um, adsorption phenomenon. So you're recreating, you're always generating new minerals to have new adsorption sites. And so, so that tends to be um, the more common case than, than the previous one. So usually we don't see a problem with hitting a maximum capacity. Hey, Scott. Um, so I just want to let you know that um, in that second picture with Don and you, you kind of look a little bit like Keanu Reeves from The Matrix. <laughs> that. So that is hilarious that you say that because guess what everybody in China would say? They would come up and say, oh, you look just like Keanu Reeves. And they're like, I'd <laughs> laugh. It's like, it's only because of the sunglasses. I don't really look that much yeah, like yeah, you. It's yeah, just the yeah, sunglasses. You could, have, you could have done those, those, those kung fu yeah. moves from The Matrix here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, one uh, more on a more serious note, I noticed that with you, the uranium levels in Pennsylvania, they're like off the charts. Okay, so is that the fact that basically where those kind of points are located, you have really high alkalinity in the groundwater there? Yeah. And we're talking about 200, 300 milli equivalents yep. of alkalinity in this ground. That's so right. That, is that the reason, real reason? Yep. Okay, got it. Confirmation. Sorry. Um, I have a question. So we talked about sort of regenerating the contaminants coming in, um, but how about in places where they're not being regenerated? It, as they get mobilized, if, if you had the ability to do filtration or whatever, yeah. eventually would you deplete them enough to where 
you know, so it would be a temporary problem rather yeah. than an ongoing one. Yeah, th that's um, two parts on that. One, I don't know how complicated to make this answer. So, um, yes, if you have a finite quantity, in fact, this is something that Orange County has observed in some of their infiltration ponds, so maybe I'll use that as an example. They had strata that had arsenic in it. And as their water percolated through, it was picking up the arsic. And then you could see two things happening. One, as that water flowed downfield from the strata that had the arsenic, the concentrations were quite, high, well, problematically high right after it. And then they, they were attenuated over time. So by the time they got to the supply well and pumped the water out, it was never a problem. But you also saw that over time, and they, they, they do this in pulses, so they'll, they'll fill up the irrigation um, pond for some, or irrigation, the infiltration pond for some period of time, let the water percolate. And then they'll stop, and then they might do it again. And so after each successive event, the arsic pulses got less and less and less because you were stripping the arsic out. So it eventually does get diluted out and goes away, and you have that finite quantity. Where you have really big problems is that when you have um, a lot, like some of their other aquifers that they're using just have uh, really, really large strata with arsic in it that would take hundreds of years to really pump enough water through to see it extracted. So, that, so it really becomes the, uh, a matter of the the amount of the quantity of the contaminant relative to the quantity of water that's coming through it. And that, that's really the, 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 the ratio that you have to play with. Hi, um, for the average person that doesn't have maybe your level of chemistry chops, but cares about the issue, what are some of the messages that you can say to a legislator, a policymaker, to get them to understand how big of a deal this is yeah. and that we need to pay attention to it and think long term? Yeah, that's a great question. L let me be California centric again because I think it's a really good example. So, California, after this long standing drought, I'm back up one thing. I would you know, I think of California, okay, so I'm a Californian, so I'm biased on this way. I think California, yeah, they're really progressive, but <laughs> we are awful with water management I and mean, we were so backwards on that side. Um, so it's only recently that groundwater, uh, groundwater still is not tracked in terms of how much is being pumped out and quality's measured some but not a lot. So not this long-standing drought motivated Sacramento or the um, legislature to start thinking about how they might invoke some degree of groundwater management. So they came up with um, guidelines, and, they, and I think it's pretty clever how they did this because it's kind of the wild, wild west, but they figured out how to manage it. But mostly what everybody's thinking about is quantity, right? So everybody's thinking about how do we get enough water back into the subsurface so that our aquifers aren't being depleted. And that's, like, every water district's focused on that. And so the number one thing I would say is that that is really, really problematic because, yes, you do need to think about sustaining the water quantity, but if you do that in the absence of thinking about what it's going to do to the water quality, you're going to have a big problem and it becomes really, really so much more expensive and so much more difficult to deal with after the fact. So number one is just to, to tell, you know, to get it across to the policymakers that every aquifer has a contaminant in it and you need to think about what that's going to, what your management perspective is going to do in terms of the contaminant. That's number one. Number two is that um, most of these elements now we're starting, there's always exceptions, which is, you know, for me a really exciting thing because then it's like, oh, why does that happen? Let's go study it. But it's really problematic from the standpoint of that's when you have bad, um, bad outcomes. But, um, but our, our knowledge about how the chemistry of these is continuing to increase so that if, you, if we say like, okay, we're going to go and manage uh, an aquifer uh, in the central plains, I'm not going to worry about arsenic so much. I'm going to worry much more about uranium. So let's manage around how we deal with uranium, which is, I already mentioned, keep the calcium and the carbonate low. We want to keep the water, if we could, less oxygen. But if it gets oxygenated, as long as we're, we're keeping the pH up and not too much calcium carbonate, shouldn't be a problem. So we know if you just team the, the policymakers up with people who really know the chemistry, you can end up finding solutions to all these. And there are now um, an increasing body of literature that's very accessible to um, people without um, chemistry chops, if you will, now on how to, to deal with this. The um, uh, Environmental Defense Fund just put out a really nice publication around managing California's groundwater with all these different permutations of what you want to think about given the different hazards. So those are the two things, is that one, that there's contaminants, you need to be aware of that, and two, we can manage around those, but you need to go and make sure that you find the right management tools. Is 
Thanks, you. Uh, thank you for your talk. <coughs> Going back to the Orange County example, uh, you said that uh, if there is a release of the contaminants, they can tweak the chemistry in the groundwater and they change the balance and reabsorb or whatever they do with yeah. the contaminants, uh, sequester them. Uh, so, and then there is a, you didn't talk much about the reactive transplant in the groundwater. So I assume most of it is diffusion limited, probably. And uh, for the system to take, uh, to reach the equilibrium, it may take real long time scale. So how do you make sure that mm. the monitoring wells are not biased? Yeah. Um, so I would say, first of all, I don't think that they may, they may never reach equilibrium because they're always, tw they, they're injecting a lot of water. So they can, it's very unusual. They control, let back up. So normally with, we think of, um, I, the way I think of it is that the sediments usually dominate the water chemistry, but they're putting so much water through these systems that they're actually inverting that, that they can control almost the sediment chemistry based on how much water they're putting through. Um, the, this is all advectively controlled. There is, you know, some clay lenses and so on that are in there that have diffusion, diffusional properties that then um, impact some of the water. But mostly, it's advection that that's there. So, and they have very. This is the other thing. It's a very sophisticated organization. So they have very good transport models. And so we we backdrop the reactive component onto it. But um, in terms of the transport, they they have that down pretty well. Um, and so. Uh, the, the answer, though, in terms of if it's, if it's going to be a short-term or long-term problem, those are things that, um, I didn't really talk about it because I just blew through it quickly, but we actually model the kinetics. Those curves are all kinetic reactions that are being used to simulate what's happening. So, so we take into account the fact that it's not going to be at equilibrium and it's actually going to be a, um, kinetically controlled. And we know that because how fast they can change the, the water chemistry, that, that the system's just not going to drive to equilibrium. And if they would hold it steady for a while, then we could maybe change that. But they, they're constantly tweaking it a bit to try to optimize things to try to get the arsenic down, down to its lowest point. Um, there, I know there was people over here too. That, yeah, uh, I have a question about like if you look at arsenic or other contaminants as a global issue for groundwater quality, uh, do you think that the anthropogenic activities have a more pronounced effect? or the natural phenomenon? Mm. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna answer it. <laughs> if you haven't caught this, I like to answer um, never with singular um, things. <laughs> Classic scientist. Uh, so the, I'm gonna say it in the reverse order, that, I, that I, we have to be really careful that anthropogenic activity, to acknowledge that anthropogenic activities can cause Either, either promote or retard the contaminant. So we have, when we're managing an aquifer, we can have control over what's happening. And we have to be really cognizant of when we're doing something problematic, right? And that's, I'm, we're seeing that a lot in California, right? So there are ways to, to do it better and we're, we're starting to see some of those, but there are ways that are presently being used that are gonna be really problematic for, for groundwater quality. So that, that's my first message is that not to get be asleep at the wheel. Second one though is that hey, right now, if you look globally, um, the biggest problems are actually just have been totally naturally occurring. So the, so the biggest elephant in the room is arsenic and groundwater of Asia. And that is all historic. It's been there for thousands of years, long before anybody ever did anything to the aquifer systems. So, so that would be the, the, the truth, the, the real answer. But I don't want that, that make people get then, oh, well then maybe we just, we can't do anything about it, so let's just forget it. Okay, and as a um, soil chemist, do you think we can find a way to deal with arsenic permanently and in an efficient and like economically in a way that like um, countries like Bangladesh and other countries can deal with it chemistry wise and money wise. Yeah, the answer to that for, for domestic use or, or for water use, yes. And so uh, let me give you a quick example on one of these, the great things about when you learn a lot about how arsenic is being bound or, or it's being liberated, you can look at the areas and say like, well, why isn't it problematic here? The arsenic is sticking really well to the sediments. And then you say like, oh, that's what's happening there. Let's use that as a reverse engineering system to go and make a filter out of it. And you can do that really cheaply. The, you can make iron oxide filters that work really, really well. And then it transfers from being, this is something that's really important that I haven't gone into at all, but um, 
I work on the science and then team with people to work on the technology. But that's only gets you so far. And then after that, you need to think about the economic, the political, and the cultural aspects. And that's really right now where the problem and the end point um, of the problem really is, is getting over those hurdles to, to implement the solutions. But they exist, and they exist in economically viable mechanism. The big one is rice. So the, I didn't talk about food, but that's actually the big elephant in the room is that all these soils have arsenic in them. It's getting more arsenic from the irrigation water. That's not easy to get out. It's not, e it's, in fact, you can't. There's, there's no way that I can think of how you get that out. So you're getting it into the rice paddies and that then gets into the rice. And as we get warmer, it gets worse. So food systems are actually gonna be a much, much bigger challenge on that whole arsenic issue. That's my second talk. That'll be tomorrow at three. <laughs> Thank you, Scott, for the excellent talk. Uh, so I would like to follow up on the or Orange County uh, example. You talked about the chemical solution. So I was wondering uh, if I understood you correctly, most of the arsenic comes from the clay lenses. Uh, so yeah, um, I didn't get into that, but in, in um, Orange County, it actually doesn't. Orange County actually has it in the primary aquifer itself. <laughs> Down okay. below. In the, they have, you know, it's a, it's a broad distribution system. So in some of the areas where they have percolation ponds, it's actually in clay layers that mm -hmm. are deposited. But in the primary one that I was showing, it's actually in the set, in the, in the sands and gravels. Okay. And then it's the other side where the arsenic comes from, the clay lenses. Yeah, it's Vietnam. So I was wondering if you put strategically your pumping wells not in the clay lands, mm -hmm. yeah. then you would prefer preferentially draw water from the coarser layers. Yep. That would at least uh, reduce the problem, I suppose. Yep, okay. Th that's correct. And Central Valley of California has exactly that scenario and you see almost um, verbatim what you just described happening where people have screened across the clay layers, you end up getting arsenic and where you're not, you're better with the caveat that where you're seeing massive overdraft, it's compressing the, the clay layers enough that you're still bleeding into the primary aquifer. So we see lots of recent land subsidence. You see arsenic everywhere in the aquifer. Right, thank you. The second point is uh, to, to echo your comment about California, California not being very good at managing water in terms of quantity. I had a visitor from Israel he spent his sabbatical at UC Davis, mm. and he said when he hears uh, California talking about lacking water, he said he laughs. Yeah. <laughs> so there are a lot of things that Israel yeah. has done that I think we can learn from. Yeah, so. and especially on, they're really, really good on the water use efficiency side. And right, thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. Hello. Hi. Um, I have a question because we live in a very, in a land that has a lot of earthquakes. Mm. So how does the direct injection can work oh. in this kind of land? Yeah, great question. Um, so it depends on how deep your injection is. And so if, uh, if you look I, I, probably everybody has seen this, right? What state has the most seismic activity now? Oklahoma. Exactly, Oklahoma, right? So small earthquakes, but that basically is from water injection causing a, a destabilization of the frictional forces in the crust that allows the, the um, energy to dissipate, and so you get these small earthquakes. Um, and the sh these are really shallow. Even the deeper systems that I'm showing 300, 400 feet, something like that, um, is not where you have any slippage planes. So um, effectively, we, the, the geophysicists are quite content with us saying inject all the water you want into those shallower aquifers and it's um, not an issue. But if we're doing deep subsurface injection, then it becomes a bigger issue. Yeah. But those that isn't where we would recover the water for um, domestic uses or, or for irrigation. Scott, I, I was... 
It is okay. I was really struck by that map of the uranium and the nitrate in Nebraska. Yeah. It's like this bomb <laughs> in the middle of the country. Yeah. And it makes perfect sense. Nebraska has the most irrigation of any state in the United States, and they yeah. grow a lot of corn. Yeah. And I know that crops can take up uranium, and it can be toxic to the crop. So I'm wondering, are the concentrations just so low that we don't hear a lot of talk about crop problems with corn and yeah. soybean in Nebraska with uranium? Yeah, there's two reasons why you don't. One is that the concentrations uh, are low enough that it isn't causing direct problem. The second one is that the, um, the soils in Nebraska actually tend to um, have low enough calcium carbonate levels that it's actually reabsorbing quite nicely in the soils. So there is a buildup and so maybe you know, 20 or 30 years, 40 years, 50 years down the road, that could be a bigger problem as you start saturating the, the absorption sites we were talking about earlier. But right now it's, it's retention that, it's a smaller quantity and, a, and, a, and good retention that's keeping things um, safe. See, I may came, you know, come to, I may uh, come to a wrong uh, presentation. I thought it's about oil, soil, and then environmental. Oh. But one question, how do you drain your water at home? Do how? you just drain it from it, or you just say drain it like all the filters? Yeah, great question. Um, by and large, tap water in the U.S. is actually really good. Um, my wife likes to drink it through a um, carbon filter because you know, it removes some of the, the taste issues that I can't pick up, but she likes. So we have some that is, is filtered through a Brita, kind of classic Brita filtered. But I'm lazy and I don't want to wait for it. It's too slow, so I just drink it straight on the tap. <laughs> The things like in Delaware, a lot of people have well. Ah, yeah. So any suggestions, you know, yeah. because like, um, how do you do it? You know, we cannot make a system yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah. No, okay. That, if you have, if you're on a well, then I guess the first thing I would do is I would, I would be making sure that I had some monitoring that occasionally I was taking water and having it tested. That's not, you know, too expensive. So you could, could run, um, and I would just do a full screening, mostly around um, metals and maybe some. I'm not so personally worried about nitrate, but I know some of the health people really cringe when I say that. So, um, but mostly I'd worry about the metals and I would screen it once in a while. And then, then if it's problematic, then I would start thinking there are some really nice secondary filters you can put in that are not too expensive that would scavenge them out. So that's how I would, would go with it. Oh, and don't make me wrong. I think that it's a very good presentation. Oh. I don't know. No. <laughs> you know? And at least I know a lot of things yeah. like this. I lived in California yeah. before. Yeah. I never knew about all this. Yeah. Like you say, we just care whether we have the water, but yeah. the quality is another thing. Yeah. But here in Delaware, it's completely different. Yeah, agreed. And I think it's a school I teach people about that, and that's yeah. wonderful. Yeah. And thank you. Sure, welcome. Uh, Scott. Um, you probably remember this, but you know, you've know you done, published some seminal papers on arsenic, but you recall that some of the first work on arsenic was done here when you were a student, yeah. where we looked at arsenic adsorption on the ferrohydrite. And it turns out that that particular paper is my most cited paper. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's, yeah. if it's not your top, it's in the top two or three. Yeah. So you were uh, doing work on arsenic many, many years before it yeah. became such an important uh, contaminant. Yeah. No question. Okay. <laughs> yes, that's very true. Uh, here's a question. Sorry. Um, uh, thanks for the very interesting talk. Um, for the uh, impact of over plumbing that causes shrinking uh, clay layer, I was wondering with population growth and urbanization at many more places will see over plumbing. So what type of impacts on water quality do we expect to see? Yeah, bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's one of the things I really try to, to um, get people to understand is that you can't, besides the overdraft problems that you're just gonna be you know, drawing down the, the water and, and, ha and um, often having to drill deeper and deeper to, to accommodate that, you actually can have really damning effects in terms of the water chemistry down there. And so um, what you need to do is really be thinking about sustainable water management. And that includes thinking about making sure that you don't get into this um, 
inelastic um, compression. So you, so you may have to keep your water levels within somewhere like 15% of their, of their present value. And if you don't, then you're gonna start seeing that you're gonna get aquifer compression and subsidence and problems with things like arsenic coming in the water. So that's basically to say is that people have to be thinking about active management. Very quickly, I just want to, um, I'm just curious. Do you know maybe what the active desorption sites for uranium are, like in the sediments? Uh, they vary um, quite a bit, but by and large, and this is classic, um, is that it's the iron and, and particularly the iron minerals, but some of the manganese minerals that are the dominant places that we see the uranium absorbing onto. There are other places that it's perfectly happy to go onto. You'll see some onto the, some of the uh, luminosilicate clays and particularly edge sites, but um, for the most part, the iron oxides continue to be the, one of the dominant factors that are controlling uranium and arsenic, and they're just quite reactive and, and tend to, to be that play that role. Yeah? All right. Thanks. This is great. I enjoy that part a lot. Let's thank Scott again. Oh, wow. Cool. All right. Um, there's, uh, as I mentioned before, there's going to be a reception. Uh, so as you open the double doors, it's all uh, set up and ready. So please uh, join us if you can um, and get more, more intimate time with our speaker. <laughs>